the moon's going to be at its perigee, apogee. You're, you're the moon expert. Why are, you, why are you looking at me? You've got the roles reversed. I'm supposed to just ask these stupid questions. Apogee is the farthest point. Okay. So the moon is at its apogee of its orbit, of its orbit. <laughs> God damn it, I can't say these words. It's the furthest away that it's going to audit the planet. <laughs> can, you, can you print out your receipts a little bigger, please? <laughs> Honest Andy's Discount Moon Show! What the hell's going on? It's Tuesday evening. Yes, it is Tuesday This evening. is not podcast night. This is not podcast night, and I actually wanted to have kind of like an emergency podcast, because I marked it on the calendar of 10th of September, we should meet up, because that was the night after the Chandrian 2 lander hit the moon's surface and the little rover that's on board it, so Vikram and Pragyan, they will have landed on the moon, they'll be sending back data, so I wanted to have an emergency podcast to talk all about it. Unfortunately... How did it go, Andy? Well, if you've seen from the news, it did not go according to plan. So if you will put on this black armband that I have. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's got a very sad moon emblazoned on it. <laughs> uh, yes, unfortunately, it did not go to plan. In the final phase of the breaking, so when the thrusters were firing, very much like what happened to the uh, Israel mission, the Bereshit mission, as... Vikram was descending to the lunar surface, contact was lost, and it appears to have hit the surface of the moon. There was various data captured during the trajectory, such as the Sea Sparser's radio telescope traces, which kind of indicate a sharp increase in velocity just as the uh, signal was lost, which indicates that it started to increase in velocity, which means the thrusters slammed it into the moon. <laughs> so the thrusters worked, but yes, just the wrong way. Just the wrong way. It's a, it's a real shame because they had lots of trackers and they had lots of guidance systems on the little lander. But what I think must have happened is one of them malfunctioned or a thruster went off at the wrong time. Uh, just because it's, it's going through a very mild atmosphere. It's going through the moon's gravity. It's been hurtling at, I think, 13 kilometers a second. And it's going down to something like 7 kilometers a second. So it's like doing some serious braking. So this is like if you brake a car at a very high speed, it's a bit unpredictable. And this is what's happening now. It's a bit unpredictable. It, it's understandable that it failed. It's a shame that it failed, but they did a bloody good job getting where they did. Yeah, I mean, as I did uh, image rec recognition as my dissertation. At, okay. uh, yeah, so I know a bit about trying to um, process images and make some sense out of them. And yeah, to do this in real time in a foreign body, uh, as in a, a foreign planet, so you haven't tested it there. Yeah. Um, at however many kilometres a second, that's tricky. So I can well imagine that, you know, it's flipped upside down, it's looked at the star, or the camera's got images of the stars, somehow correlated them with craters and said, right, yeah, I'm I'm heading towards the planet, or, or the, the moon, I will fire my thrusters. Yeah. And it's, it's just got, it's got confused as to which way up it is. Yes, I think that was the case. I think uh, it did get confused as to when to fire the thrusters. This has happened with other satellites as well. Um, I think there was one that was trying to touch down on Mars and it's when, as it went through the atmosphere, it started to tumble. So it fired its parachute, but the instruments just went a bit haywire and they were like, oh, severed the parachute. And then it just went smack straight into the surface. Yeah, I mean, it's also um, the same as the Boeing issue. I can't remember which version of plane it is. Or not literally the same, but the Boeing issue had a, a, a computer error where it thought it was above a certain line and then uh, okay it, so it had to do some sort of correction where it would uh, put the plane down a bit because it would naturally fly a bit high and then some sort of out by one error or one of those computer errors that gets in uh, it said no i'll push it down a bit i don't care what the pilots say oh uh, which then obviously caused caused the plane crashes yes um so yeah even on sort of terrestrial uh, computer systems that are uh, well safety critical 
yeah. um, in aeroplanes. This has happened in uh, submarines as well, where random codes try to calculate things and guidance systems just for some reason divided by zero. Mm. Everything ground to a halt because it was just na 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 being outputted. It just failed. Yeah, uh, for the non-computer literate, or <laughs> not even computer literate, but as in <laughs> the people who haven't done floating point uh, arithmetic, what's NAN? N-A-N, which, is, does that tra translate to, like, infinity? It, it translates to not a number. No, we had a whole module of the oh. eight weeks on flipping floating point arithmetic, so yeah. yeah. This, uh, this uh, submarine didn't divide by zero and then try to call out for its grandmother. Yeah. Going, nan, 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 nan. No, it was saying, not a number. Yeah, so that means if you divide by zero, you get infinity, but they don't record infinity in, you can't record like an in, infinite number in binary. Uh, so they just record not a number, like it's gone wrong, so nan. Yeah. Uh, and then if you try to, you know, do the rest of the calculations, you end up with things like nan plus four or nan minus <laughs> five or nan multiplied by six and I mean the logic is fine if you do not a number times five you get not a number so yeah. in that way it's mathematically consistent but it's not helpful if you're trying to guide a submarine or d do anything else you you really need a an error handling uh, exception loop there yes and while there might have been an error handling thing on Chandrian 2 uh, unfortunately this error happened 2.1 kilometers above the surface and was estimated to be traveling at about 60 meters per second as the uh, as it lost contact. So if it thrusted then, like in the opposite direction, so they think it tumbled and fired the thrusters when it was upside down. So instead of firing away from the moon, it fired towards the moon. Yeah, uh, just to point out, it's not like complete failure. Oh, absolutely it, it, not. It got through like uh, three of the four phases of landing, was it? Or Yeah, the four phases were... Uh, rough breaking, coasting phase, fine breaking, and the terminal phase. And it was the terminal phase, appropriately named, that it terminated and uh, unfortunately failed at that point. And while it's basically like timesing it by zero in the eyes of the press, that, oh, it crashed, therefore it's a failure. But no, it, the rough breaking is when it's doing like the hard slam on the brakes. The coasting phase is when it's adjusting as it's coming into the right area for landing. The fine breaking phase is when it's just like doing the light thrusters to make sure it's on the right trajectory. And then the terminal phase will be when it's actually firing the thrusters to get it where it needs to go. And the guidance systems are actually scanning the ground. Yeah, because um, look, looking at it, the, uh, the lander bit was a, an addition. It's got a few scientific experiments on, but I think it's more of a prestige thing. Whereas actually the orbiter has a lot more in terms of scientific merit. Yeah, it absolutely does. The orbiter has so much equipment on there compared to the first Chandrian mission as well. But this soft landing is a huge achievement. It's kind of like a badge of honor amongst countries. Uh, so far, Russia, China and America are the only countries that have managed to do it. And Israel tried, failed. India have tried and unfortunately failed in this instance. However... They are trying to recover, make contact with the Vikram lander. Like they've spotted it, it's in one piece, it's tilted. So they're trying to, they're trying to recover it. Are you imagining like robot wars? Sort of self, <laughs> self writing mechanism. Oh, it's with got a <laughs> streamic! It's got a streamic! It's like Craig Charles is uh, doing a rhyme at the end. And Jonathan Pierce is narrating from a from the actual orbiter, going like, <laughs> "Oh, we're going to send Sir Killalot out from the Herschel crater. He's out of the crater patrol zone." <laughs> <laughs> Mind, yeah, that would be a horrible place for robots. There's pits everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> and, they've, and they've also got the delay of dealing with the moon. Oh, it's only by a second or so, though. Yeah, okay. But that's crucial when you're actually trying to flip them. Yeah, although I, I always find that Robot Wars is a bit anticlimactical in that they, they, they're not controlling it properly. It's as though they've got genuine problems controlling it, as opposed to if you're playing Mario Kart or any computer game where it's a direct yeah. sort of, right, I've got instant control, whereas for some yeah. reason Robot Wars seems a bit clunky of... Yes, it does that. And it's just when they just stop working and then they just basically flip them out. It was always wonderful when it was like a child on the team and then they'd send out the house robot and utterly dismantle the robot and destroy it and toast it just to make the kids cry, basically. 
Yeah, all the ones I saw where they got like blatantly a dad, and it said, "Oh, and here's my child. He won't get to touch the robot." Uh, <laughs> but I bought it. <laughs> my application to the BBC is stronger if I have a child. Yes. So I borrowed my neighbours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So here's little Jimmy. He made a sticker for the robot. You know, do you remember Big Brother? Yes. That, that like, little black robot with the flipper. Oh, right. Sorry, I thought you meant the... No, no, no. Like, did, did you watch Robot Wars? Like, or do you remember the robots fondly? I watched the first series got, and got the hang of it and then never really watched it again because it's all the same. It is. Apart awesome. from when Hypnodisc turned up and just killed everyone. Hypnodisc was brilliant. Yeah. But I'm on about Big Brother. No. Did people. it just film people? <laughs> or put, push them into room 101 and feed them with rats? Not quite. It pushed them in the pit and then Matilda fell in. Uh, no, it was black kind of uh, dome that had a flipper on it. But I entered Techno Games when I was a kid. What was that? Techno Games was the um, basically Olympic Games, but for robots. Oh, right. And you had, this was like when Robot Wars was like at it, the peak of its popularity. I entered it with a little Connect robot that had some built-in things, that some additional things that allowed it to be entered. So you couldn't just like get a robot off a, off a shelf and like one of those kits from the National Trust, like build your own robot. <laughs> no, 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 it, it, you had to actually make it. I like the National Trust robot though. Yeah, it drives that. around and just cleans photos and <laughs> restores paintings. <laughs> tells you not to sit on the furniture. You can look, but you can't touch. Yeah. And then tells you about, you know, this was room was run by the Duke of Peterson. And this is authentic wallpaper. We've had to restore it over 50 years. But <laughs> going back to my point, I entered Techno Games and it had a load of people from Robot Wars there. So I actually met the kids who helped out with Big Brother and I got to hang out with them and I went around and I met all of the people from Ro Robot Wars. I met uh, George Francis from Chaos 2. Cool. Or George Francis from Chaos 2 because he always had a high voice. I met uh, Professor Noel Sharkey. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, he was there. I met the Razor team. I met loads of people and these were like superstars when you're like 11 and really into Robot Wars. Oh right, cool. So what yeah, not to d diversify from the moon. Uh, so what, what did you have to do for techno games? So I... So smash you... another robot to pieces? No, no, it was like the sprinting event, the swimming event, the climbing event. So you built a robot that could climb a rope or you could build a robot that could swim uh, or enter the sprinting one. I entered the sprinter, but the idea of the sprinting one is it couldn't have wheels. It had to have legs. Otherwise, you just adapt a remote control car. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. So so I got to the phase where they got to see a robot and then they'd be like, no, oh, <laughs> hard pass. <laughs> but they didn't say that in person to the child who came all the way out to Birmingham to- Do they not even run it? Basically audition your robot and say, right. this is my robot, this is what I can do. And if it was impressive enough, looked good, it was clear that a child made it, so you get on the BBC, then they put you through on TV. It's like the screening for X Factor, because you want to make sure you've got the naff ones going on for audience to laugh and jeer at them. And then you get the good ones with the very interesting backstory about, oh, I broke my toe on the way in. Right, um, yeah, yeah, my cat's that. dead. I'm, a, I'm doing it for my nan, who, yeah. who was a robot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. For my nan, who was killed by Sir Kill a lot. Yeah, that's it. So yours was a middling robot, basically. And yeah. you had no backstory. Yeah. Oh, right. Did it work, your one? Yeah, yeah. It did, it did a little sprint. It couldn't go very fast. And considering that the one that did win did 100 metres in eight seconds, <laughs> that was never going to win. <laughs> Was it just like a sprinter they covered it in tinfoil? I know, it was, the guy, it was George Francis from Chaos 2. He won it. Oh, right. And he built like this little robot that had, it was on spokes, so the legs, uh, so the legs basically sprinted, very much like how a greyhound will run perfectly. Oh, so right. all of its legs will just be in perfect synchronicity with each other. It was like that, but with eight of them. And it was tiny and it just, oh, it was right. like out like, like a whippet. Oh, this has taken a massive tangent from yeah. the Indian mission. That's fine, yeah. Oh, well, cool. Where were we? We were just oh, uh, talking about Shreemex. Yeah, so, okay, so they're, they're still looking for it. They still could recover it, potentially, or um, get a signal off it. But back to the Vikram lander that may or may not have a Shreemex, because it's in one piece and it appears to be tilted. They're trying to recover it. They're trying to make connection with it. They're trying to send down a signal. They're, they're just trying to make contact with it. It'll be wonderful if they do, but I'm not hopeful. 
Yeah, looking at the images online, um, they do have like little, I think they call them scientific experiment one, two and three or whatever, which are little probes that come out and presumably measure something. But yeah, if one of those happened to be able to like push it back up, that'd be quality. That, that's an actual Shremek. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that is what it is. By the way, Shremek was a Robot Wars term that meant self-writing mechanism. That's what it's short for, but they just called it Shremek. In general, final thoughts on it. Mine were, this is pretty impressive because they, they didn't get the cherry on the cake, but they got most of the cake, you know, to put an orbiter in orbit around the moon and to get through three of the four phases of landing. That's still pretty impressive. Yeah. And they did it on a budget. Yes, they did do it on a budget. Yeah, it, it has been a success. success. And the orbiter, it was assumed to have one year left of fuel left once it did all the correcting. Uh, they basically had a fuel budget and they assumed that most of it would get used up put it, putting it in the correct orbit. But they didn't need to use any of it. So they've got seven years worth of fuel, which is a huge success for this. You know, taking your cake analogy with the cherry, I would say that the cherry has fallen off the cake. They're just trying to find the cherry. And if they do find it, they can dust it off a bit and put it back on. <laughs> Five second rule. So, Andy, I've read they found gel on the moon. Where did you read this? Uh, on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> no one lies on the internet. No, no, uh, it must be true. And it's from China. The Chinese have found gel on the moon. They found a gel-like substance on the moon, allegedly. If you're referring to what I think you're referring to, this was found by the Chinese lander, which was the Chang'e 4 lander, which carried aboard a little rover, very much like the Vikram and Pagra missions were meant to do. Uh, and this rover was called U-2-2, which is a ma bit of a mouthful to say. <laughs> it's named after the popular band for those who like it in a group, as in, oh, you like you too, too. <laughs> this rover is on the far side of the moon, exploring one of the little, one of the craters over there, which is the Von Kraem crater. And it's taking panoramic photos. And during which one of the photos it took had a odd substance in the middle, which was reported as a gel-like substance, which is quite alarming, really. You think gel-like substance, you think toothpaste, you think like a jelly of kinds, which to me indicates liquid. Yeah. Which is and huge. There's not much liquid on the moon, on the surface anyway. No, there's like a Apart few- from ice. There, there will be a little bit of ice, but that's permafrost from like comets trapped in craters. But actual liquid water is huge. In the, out in the open, this would be massive. So, and you might be thinking, why hasn't this been reported more? Why hasn't this been shouted from the rooftops that semi-liquid has found on the moon? Well, it's because it's not true. It was a translation mishap. It was a Chinese space agency press release that said, they didn't find gel, they found shaving foam. <laughs> <laughs> they found U2-1. Uh, they didn't find U2-1. They found Bono. <laughs> It did wasn't you two that did Dark Side of the Moon, was it? That was Pink Floyd. Oh, no. That would have been a good joke. It was That joke was right on the edge. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, which is the guitarist from U2, by the way. Thank you. For those of you who didn't get the joke, I'm full of them today. What they reported they found was gel with mysterious luster. The fascinating colours seem to imply its extraordinary life. Now, this was reported in Chinese through Chinese characters which when put through Google Translate are not ideal. In fact, the characters in question can be translated as glass or shiny and have also got synonyms or can be translated as gluey, glossy, or even gum. So what has been found in the middle of this crater is most likely glass and they will have found a glass-like substance, which makes perfect sense because in the middle of the crater is where the explosion from the impact will have happened, and that's where all the heat is, and it will convert all of the rock to lava, and in some case, glass. I mean, that's what happened in the Manhattan Project, when they detonated bombs in the middle of the desert, they had glass in the craters, or glass-like substance in the craters, because that's left over when you heat up sand. <laughs> it's like a very aggressive way of making glass, though. Oh, yeah. If your two options are Venice and the moon, I'd just go to Venice. As what Bond did. As what Bond did, yeah. In Moonraker, which we might talk about later, depending on how we're feeling. 
Shall we do some foreign moon news? Yes, that would be lovely. Where are they going to look for alien life? Potentially alien life on the Jovian and Galilean moon of Europa, which has always been hypothesized to have a subsurface ocean. Like photos of the surface indicate that it's actually an icy surface. And there's two theories that it's very much like Earth, like you've got a molten core, rocky mantle, and then there's two options. One is a thick layer of warmish semi-melting ice, and then you've got ice on the surface with like cracks and whatnot, or a thick layer of ice on the top that's a couple of kilometers thick, and then a subsurface ocean of liquid saline water, very much like our oceans. And if that is the case, those are the perfect conditions to harbor alien life. Because if you look at the bottom of our oceans, you've got the thermal vents at very high temperatures in pitch black, still got life there. Uh, yeah, just to um, dampen down any alien conspiracy theorists, this isn't alien life as in little green men sentiently wandering around with laser cannons and no, you know, UFOs. This is a, a sort of amino acids type level of potentially, you know, bacteria type stuff. Yes, but you could find things like, I don't know, like worms, tapeworms, bacteria, bacteria, maybe even small fluke worms and fish. Cool. There is potential that you might find plant life there, you might find algae. There is a lot of potential, potential for life. I cannot stress this enough that we don't know yet because the mission hasn't happened. So the Galilean missions and the Juno missions, well, maybe not the Juno missions, I'm not sure if Juno's going to Europa, but the Galilean missions have gone around the moons, they've gone around Europa and they've taken some images. So this mission, in fact, there's two missions going to Europa, but the one that was announced recently was the Europa Clipper, which is going to be launched by NASA. And that is going to go to Europa, it's gonna perform a flyby, and it's going to measure what has been kicked out of the surface. So through impacts, through um, volcanic plumes from the surface, because it's got cryovolcanoes on the surface, uh, which is kind of like a volcano, but instead of lava, it spews out water. So it's going to hopefully capture what's coming out of this moon, measure it, and look for the traces of organics that make up amino acids. Oh, cool. And so you said there's another one. So NASA's... NASA's doing it. Yeah, NASA's doing it with the Europa Clipper. Uh, that is getting launched in 2025 and it's going to do a few gravitational slingshots and it's hopefully going to get to Jupiter probably about eight years later because it takes a while to get there. Uh, but before then, the JUICE mission, <laughs> JUICE uh, standing for Jupiter IC Moons Explorer, so J-U-I-C-E. E. That's a rubbish acronym. It is. Like, it really annoys me when you have acronyms like this. For people who are not reading the text, it's like they've taken the J-U from Jupiter, I-C, the I-C from the word I-C, nothing from the word moons, and then the E from explorer. Yeah, so it's, it's just randomly selecting letters. It, yeah, exactly. If you took the first letter of this, this would be the JIME mission. It's sufficiently good, yeah. if, if not better. You could have a jingle for JIME. Yes. But the JUICE mission is due to launch in 2022. That's assuming it's all going to go to plan, so things might get kicked back. But this is part of the ESA's cosmic vision, ESA being European Space Agency, not some Eastern Anglo-Saxon agencies. <laughs> no, it's European Space Agency. That's how you do an acronym, ESA. Yeah, they did it properly for their name. Yeah. I know it well, by the way. I used to work for ESA. Oh, cool. Or a subcontractor of ESA. Impressive. Yeah, we're going, going into the, uh, the origin story. You did techno games, I used to work for ESA. <laughs> that's, a, that's a callback to pre podcast one? No, we had a chat afterwards. Uh, so I didn't mention it on the podcast, but yeah, I, oh, yes, I, was yes. on, I worked on the Galileo navigation system. Uh, my job was to look after the security of the ground stations. Ground segment, sorry. There, there was two parts of the ground seg uh, ground infrastructure. One was to keep the satellites in the correct constellation, so you can always have three or four triangulating any bit of Earth. And then there was the ground mission segment, which was to decide what the satellites broadcast in terms of timing and stuff. So I was on the ground control segment uh, doing security. So uh, if any of the satellites go out of orbit or in the wrong place, that was ground control's problem. 
if they started broadcasting the wrong thing, that was a ground missions problem. Okay. And yeah, so a few months ago, ground... I mean, this was like 10 years ago I worked on it, but a few months ago, Galileo broke or went offline for, or something for a few days. And I was like, oh no, which which one is it? Which one is it? And it was they were broadcasting the wrong thing. So I was like, or not broadcasting at all, but they were all in the right place. So I was like, hey. No, <laughs> not, done, not my problem. Not my problem. That's all right. You know, um, Galileo's dead now. As in the bloke. Well, both the bloke and the satellite. <laughs> oh, right. Well, it wasn't just one satellite. Do you mean the satellite system? Galileo, they went to Jupiter. Oh, that's a different one. Are we thinking of two completely different two things? Two completely, yeah, yeah. So there's the Gal Galileo Global Navigation Satellite System. Um, I thought you were involved in the one that took the photos, took the very photos of Europa that, we're gonna, that we've been talking about. No. <laughs> okay. No, yeah. that would be odd. No, uh, no, there's a, you know GPS? Yes. So that's run by the Americans. Europeans wanted their own version. Right. So that's okay. called Galileo. So that's confusing. Right. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. when you say Galileo satellite, I immediately think of the Galilean missions to Jupiter, as uh, as will a lot of people, I think, unless you're in the know of sat navs and satcom. Well, yeah, that that was the thing. It's just like I work on Galileo. No one's heard of either. Hey, <laughs> yes, they have. Well, uh, in the average muggle world, it's like oh, I, work, I work on the GPS. It's like, oh, I know what GPS is. Manan's got one. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Oh, it's in the car, isn't it? It's like, well, no, the receiver's in the car, but there's satellite. All oh, right, do the satellites broadcast the maps down? No, no, that's not how they work. And it was just like, so how does the satellite know where your car is? No, no, the satellite doesn't know where your car is. Your, <laughs> your car knows where the satellites are. I don't want the government tracking me. Yeah, that, it was, oh, I, I give up. Yeah, it it's was, one of those, like, right, clocking out, say what you want, I'm just going to nod and smile. Yeah. So, no, I worked on the European version of the GPS. Okay. So, um, yeah, so all, the, all those satellites are in the right place. I was getting a bit worried that you said it was dead because it's like a billion pound project. <laughs> it's just like, they've canned it, whoa. No, no, they, um, they ended the Galilean mission by steering it into Jupiter to make sure the satellite was 100% destroyed by the atmosphere of Jupiter. There's no way it could survive it. And this was so it didn't contaminate moons like Europa, which could have life on them. Oh, that's, that's nice. It is. That's, that's how you do it, as opposed to just packing your satellite full of tardigrades and lobbing them at the moon. No one would ever do that. No, no one no. would. Moon of the month. Yeah, moon of the month time. So this month uh, is one that you might actually have heard of because it's, it's one of the more popular ones. It's actually got its own Wikipedia article. It is going to be a harvest moon, a harvest micro moon, if you will. And it's a micro moon because the moon is at its furthest point in its orbit from the Earth. So that is the apogee, I believe. I'm just going to say it is the apogee. In America, this harvest micro moon is going to fall on Friday the 13th. The clickbait article I read this in was saying, oh, we're all very spooked out by this. I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> Full moon on Friday the 13th. Happens all the time. Well, it, it's unlucky, Friday the 13th. Fact. Well, it's not going to summon Michael Myers to your farmer's market. <laughs> Go on then, on this segment we normally explain why it's that name. Can, can you possibly work out why it's called a harvest moon in autumn? This one actually has some credence to it. I, I actually quite like this. Um, it's called a harvest moon. Is it because people go to harvester? Ah, they, they want that free salad. Yes. Um, so in the time when there was no street lights, no additional light at night, you were working on the light of the sun to do all your farming, at this time of the year, the moon rises about the same time as the sun sets. So for example, between September 12th and 14th, the rising of the moon comes on average less than 27 minutes later each night, thus providing the light for farmers to continue gathering crops even after the sun has set. Now they put lights on the tractors so they don't have to worry about the moon and also clouds. They put lights on clouds. You heard it from Andy. <laughs> Uh, but yes, the clickbait article that I got uh, the Friday the 13th Harvest Moon from is housebeautiful.com, which ends the article on a very poignant, thought-provoking question of, do you have a favourite paint brand? Yes, there's one I always use, or no, they're all the same. So, Richard, do you have a favourite paint brand? Yes, but for GDPR reasons, you have to forget this in five minutes. Oh, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> so the weather's glum, a bit gloomy, we're all feeling a little dour. Don't we need some nice, chirpy, frivolous news to kind of put some spring back into our stack with some very local moon news? So last time we talked about Moon Pennsylvania and the Moon Parks and Rec Society have held a wizarding festival which was held on the 7th of September, uh, Saturday, and it, it looks like it was a resounding hit. They raised a lot for charity, the winning house being Ravenclaw, and thankfully someone has been reunited with a retainer they lost. Oh, good. <laughs> Yeah, I like the, um, the, the the fact that they've given houses. So Ravenclaw raised the most money. Gryffindor second. Poor showing from Gryffindor. Ravenclaw are the intelligent ones. So yeah. They probably did a bit of clever accountancy. Absolutely, a few yeah. offshore funds. Yeah. Slytherin third, though. So uh, not being the evil house there. Possibly being a bit more evil than the others. Uh, but Hufflepuff sort of proving they're a bit more asthmatic than oh, the others. I think, well, isn't there a thing that, that, yeah, they put more effort in than everyone else? Yeah, they're, they're the real triers. But, like, yeah. put it this way. In order to have A students, you need to have D students. And Hufflepuff are the D students. I think that was it, but yeah. I have no knowledge of Harry Potter. This is just based on assumption. Yeah, I think JK Rowling put it a bit more eloquently, but... Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they were the triers. Ravenclaw were the brainy ones. Uh, Gryffindor were the brave ones. Slytherin were the baddies. And Hufflepuff were the good effort. Yes, you tried. Uh, a for effort. Now that you've learned about this wonderful little wizarding event, do you feel a little, little bit more chipper? Uh, I do, yes. Absolutely. Excellent. Very local moon news has served its purpose. So, next article. Uh, why are they going to look at Europa for alien life when fact is it's already there? It was in the news. Where did you read this said news? The pillar of wisdom that is the express. Ah. Uh, okay. Well, uh, yes, I did see this article. <laughs> <laughs> I know you saw it because <laughs> you 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 phoned me and just shouted at me saying you were very angry. Well, it was very wise of the Express not to include a link to the video in the article because I don't want this guy getting more views than he needs. Oh, I watched the video where this guy claims to have found a alien base on Europa. He uses WorldWideTelescope.org, which has basically a mock-up of the of Europa based on satellite imagery. So some images are going to be better than others, depending on what, what photos were available at the time. So they stitch together the moon, and you can kind of zoom around it very much like you used to be able to do on Google Earth. And he has found, to quote, something absolutely mind-blowing on the moon Europa. It has some remarkable right angles, a huge fuselage-like body, and large openings at the centre, perhaps for docking alien ships. Uh, so he claims to have found a small, well, not small, it's 20 miles wide, uh, a 20 mile wide alien base. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty good. Uh, so I, I went and followed the link and uh, looked at the video. It'd be fair to say there's a bit of speculation in there. There is quite a lot of speculation in there. Now, I, I'm not going to pick him up on things that he may have said wrong or that don't quite flow, because it's quite clear that he hasn't written a script. He's just kind of recording this directly into the mic as he explores, because he was clearly quite excited about finding this and wanted to upload it onto his channel immediately. But what I will pick up on are some of the things he says, like, for example, sadly, this is all in black and white. I cannot find a colour photo of this. Now, if you type in... Europa Moon into Google Images. The first image that comes up is a wonderful colour image of the moon. And if you look at other photos of the moon, they're all in colour. In fact, the second image includes the landing site that he is talking about in crystal clear colour. So it's not like it was hard to find. He just didn't bother. He just went on this website, found something that looked like an alien space and just made a huge hoopla about it without actually, without doing any further research. And also, sadly, I cannot find a colour photo of this. I just went into Google and typed in NASA images of the European surface and lo and behold, they had the exact same Google Earth-like thing for Europa in colour, in higher definition, using the Galilean images. <laughs> well, how, how, how's he expected to know how to find that using a search engine? Well, I mean, does anyone know how to use these search engine things? Are they popular websites? Well, what are they called? <laughs> yeah, what do these search engines do? Yeah, okay, so yeah, I did notice he sort of missed that. 
And also with other things like, as you see, it's blurry here and clear here. NASA does this on purpose as it blurs out the places with the most buildings, but the people at NASA don't always recognize which ones are structures and which ones are not. Yeah, okay, so scientifically, that seems to be a lot of speculation. Uh, yes. based on, so certainly the observable evidence is that it is blurry. Yep. To be fair, I think if you've got a satellite taking photos kilometers, thousands of kilometers away from Earth, uh, if you can get a satellite up there, fair play to you. Yeah. But I don't expect perfect <laughs> pictures, to be honest. Unless, so, unless it's that satellite's job. Yeah. That's, what, that's what's happening with the lunar's, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's going around the moon, taking photos, and it's mapping the surface in high definition. There's one around Mars. They're built to do that. The Galilean missions were meant to explore, so they'll have like choice sections of the surface, the ones that are in higher definition. The blurrier ones are just from like zoomed out, uh, this should be about here, and they've mapped it on, so you have the nice Google Earth-like thing for Europa. Yeah. If you look at Google Earth, if you look at like, you know, the sea or something, it's in lower definition than your street. There's some polar islands that, because I'm quite fascinated with the Arctic, and there's a island called Jan Mayen, which is made out of a volcano. So it's between the Arctic and Iceland. So if you could see, so you've got Iceland, Svalbard, and in between the two, you've got that grey bit on the map. That's Jan Mayen. Now it's uninhabited. I think there might be like a research base there, but no one lives there. Uh, the Google Earth images of it are quite blurry. One half is in crystal clear definition. The other half isn't because there's nothing of interest there. So they just kind of like take a quick photo of it. So you can't expect every single facet of the planet to be in high definition. It's just not feasible. And it's the same for a moon orbiting Jupiter. So the, the, the observed evidence we'll agree with, but the conclusions, the scientific conclusions is NASA are deliberately altering these images um, to hide aliens is, is uh, that's very speculative, should we say? Yes. I, I also propose that if NASA wanted to hide uh, evidence of the aliens, they wouldn't publish the photos. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> and also the, the level of image quality or manipulation now is you can put videos of celebrities speaking and moving their mouths absolutely pretty much perfectly deep fakes yeah deep fakes so the idea that nasa with its budget if it did want to do a proper fake of uh, an image couldn't possibly do a fake of a static image is a bit far-fetched so yes the idea that just oh we'll just blur it a bit and then we'll miss out this uh, this big alien base so it's probably not an alien base in my view not, not based on that evidence anyway there's not sufficient evidence it's probably not an alien base based in my view as well. I can offer an educated guess as to what it is. Yes, so as someone who studied moons. In the video he says, oh, well, look at these right angles here and look at this port in the centre. This looks like a, a window that's, uh, or a port from which shape, from which alien vessels can escape from this alien base, this landing strip or something like that. Now, that's hole that window that he's referring to will probably be the crater of a cryovolcano which was which is what i mentioned before and that black smudge with the right angles on the surface is the residue that has been spewed out of the cryovolcano very much like how lava spews out of a volcano on earth and you get the black lava the dried lava that's all around it in you look at it, satellite images of a volcano you've got like the black circle around it some of it will go a little bit off depending on if it's on a hill or something like that that's very much what's happening here the residue will have spewed out and it will be making this oblong shape that's darker material than the surrounding areas so it is most likely a cryovolcano Okay, so uh, we've, we've had two people look at the uh, evidence. Uh, we'll leave it up to the li uh, listeners to decide which is more likely, no. an alien base or a cryovolcano. Yes, he does say in the video that he is open to education. He's trying to educate us, but he is open-minded and to be educated as well. So leave a comment as to what it could be. Now, I was all caps furiously typing away of what it could be and then realised, is this person going to listen to me? 
are the people, because there are a lot of people in the comments already agreeing with him, am I just going to get downvoted for actually offering a rational explanation? And I wasn't going to slag him off. I wasn't going, and when I say all caps, it was a, a initially a verbal kind of exorcism of, what are you talking about? But then deleted that, started typing something more rational with links and whatnot. But do I actually try to educate? Do I try to post a little summary of this is what it probably is based on this and that? Go on. <laughs> risk it. Risk it for a biscuit. I would also like to point out that while it's, it's a little dangerous accusing NASA of blurring out images and manipulating images that are meant to be for scientific purpose, it's not as dangerous as outright refuting scientific discoveries and claiming that the Earth is flat or the Earth is hollow. Or vaccines are bad. Yeah, it's not dangerous. This, uh, I wouldn't call it harmless speculation, but it's not as bad as some of the other stuff out there, so I can't get too riled up about it. Yeah, I mean it can well it can create anxieties and fear in certain people who are who who then perhaps believe the government are conspiring against them, um, which is probably not beneficial. No. Um, and if they think there's a, a malicious alien force about to attack them, I don't think that'll be useful for people who suffer from paranoia or anxiety. That's true. Claiming this is fact is not going to help anyone. It's just spreading false information. He does mention the thickness of the tunnels is mind-blowing. Now, there are definitely sort of veins on the, the picture of... I, I don't know if they're tunnels, but they're definitely sort of corridors or uh, lines. They're what cracks. Is? Cracks. They're cracks in the ice. Oh, okay. Because it's an icy surface, so what you're looking at here are uh, ice cracking over time. So what will happen is the subsurface will be heating up and it'll cause well, ice to melt and then freeze again. And when it freezes, it expands. So it'll be kind of like caving in on itself and then expanding and then cracking. Very Like if you look at a glacier, you'll see these cracks across it. And uh, they are miles across. Like it's like looking at the Grand Canyon from space. It's huge, but they're not tunnels connecting cities. They're cracks in ice, ravines, if you will. Oh, cool. <laughs> once, again, once again, I'll, I'll leave the listeners to make up their own mind, whether they are indeed tunnels connecting alien cities or cracks on an ice planet. Any final thoughts on the alien base of Europa? I personally uh, think you make the more compelling case. Uh, I'd <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll just say that, you know. Um, however, it's fine and dandy for other people to have other opinions and so on. Uh, I do think there is a... Uh, a slight dumbing down of science and scientific method, or what, what people think is the scientific method. You know, perhaps on a future podcast or something, you should explain, you know, this is how science works. Yeah. This is, this is how you might scientifically prove that there is alien life on Europa, which they might well do. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, as per the satellite missions. But uh, looking at a random thing, claiming it's a an alien base, and then taking any other artifacts and also claiming that kind of supports your uh, hypothesis is not particularly scientific. Yes, and also claiming there's no colour images when there are colour images and just not doing any additional legwork, jumping to a conclusion without any kind of backing it up. By the way, me claiming that that's a cryovolcano, I did say it's an educated guess. It might not be. It could be a crater from an impact. It could be, it could be anything, but I'm pretty sure it's not an alien base. So before we go, one final thing that we should do, and given this is a podcast all about moons, we should wish the moon a happy birthday. Should we? Why we, should we do that? We <laughs> should. Why is it its birthday, what, today? It's going to be its birthday on the 15th day of the 8th month, according to the Chinese lunar calendar, which this year should be between the 13th and 15th of September, so this Friday. It's going cool. to be... Should we just caveat this with, this isn't the most scientific uh, <laughs> element of a birthday. Oh, no. So, you know, we're not saying this, this is scientific. Yeah. Well, in Korea, they don't have a birthday. Everybody ages by one year, uh, New Year. Oh, cool. North or South Korea? I think it's a cultural thing, it's so I think it's both. Well, I'm glad they're agreeing on something. Uh, Koreans all age on the same day, January 1st, no matter when your birthday falls. If you're 40 years old on December the 31st, then on January the 31st, you will be 41. Oh, cool. Yeah. I've learned something. Good. But, uh, that and all the other things I learned. 
Oh, about yeah. Europa and the fact that it's the moon's birthday. On... Yeah. Well, okay. So scientifically, is it the moon's birthday? Uh, when would you take that from? Because it's hypothesized that the moon came from Theia, a Mars-like impactor that hit a young Earth and threw a chunk of lava out into space. And then that coalesced into the moon we see today. Would you take it from the day that it actually impacted it? Would you take yes. it from... Oh, okay. So it's Theia day. Theia day. Yeah. When was that? Before the Gregorian calendar and before Tuesday was a concept. <laughs> right. No birth certificate then. No, no ah. birth certificate. So for the moon's birthday, there is actually moon cake. Oh, cool. And it's a traditional moon cake here. I have some wonderful examples of what they can look like. Uh, so the main ingredient has a lard crust with a red bean filling or lotus seed paste, which doesn't sound very appealing considering you get like the Asda tray bakes. Yeah. I would rather the tray bake over this. However, some of the other photos look really, really nice. Um, there are variations of this, of course. So the fillings can be lotus seed paste, sweet bean paste, red bean paste, um, and there's regional variations. Now, because this has become a tradition, and um, you know what customs are like in China, where you have to give gifts, especially uh, between uh, businesses and clients, there has been a huge surge of high-end moon cakes in a whole range of flavors like chicken floss, tiramisu, green tea. I thought that said panda then, but it's pandan. You can't, <laughs> you can't get panda moon cakes. What's, what's chicken floss? Uh, I think it's chickens that were killed because they were doing the floss. <laughs> Quite right. <laughs> uh, Rao Song, also known as chicken floss. Right, that doesn't answer. But I'll, I will look at Wikipedia. Alternative names are meat wool. So I think it's just very, very finely strung out. Uh, it's kind of, yeah, shredded duck, but chicken. Pulled yeah. pork to the nth degree. Pulled poultry. Uh, but that is what a moon cake is. Some of these look really delightful. I'd be quite interested in the lava custard or the coffee moon cake as a big fan of coffee. But there's many, many styles. Is this uh, not a thing you should be doing for like the next episode? Baking bake a moon cake. Bake a moon cake. Do you know what? I will try and track down some moon cake from one of the Chinese supermarkets around and we'll have some. Cool. And we'll we'll offer our professional reviews. We'll, we'll offer our review on the moon cake next yeah. episode. We're getting a lot of complaints that we don't have a culinary section to the moon show. Yeah, exactly. There's only one thing left for us to do, Richard. What's that? Give the moon the bumps. It's covered in craters, so it's had too many bumps already. Play pin the tail on the comet. <laughs> no, I think we should Play see. pass the parsec. Oh! Yeah, full of them today. These oh. are wonderful. No, the one thing left for us to do is sing happy birthday to the moon. Happy birthday to moon. Happy birthday to moon. That was a wonderful tangent. Of yeah, <laughs> that was a tan tangent on a tangent. <laughs>